There's a ladder over the sidewalk, George. Come on, let's walk around it. Why, Mary, I didn't know you were superstitious. Do you mean to say you're afraid to walk under a ladder? Oh, well, I'm not exactly afraid, George, but it's supposed to bring bad luck. You know, my father... Nonsense. Why, I've walked under a good many ladders, and I'm still here to tell about it. So what's the good of taking chances, George? It's only a few steps out of the way. I wish Father hadn't been so pig-headed. Well, I refuse to listen to such utter trash. Think of all the time you lose in the course of a year if you walk around the ladder you come to. I'm going right ahead. Okay, smart guy, but you can count me up. I'm convinced after Father... Oh, you and your old man. Here I go. Just watch. Oh, George, it's... Oh, oh dear, what did I tell you? Blue paint all over your new suit. That's just what happened to Father. Only it was green paint with him. Well, that seems to start us off with a nice little splash of color. In these days when the entertainment world seems to be going in for brilliant hues, there's no reason why we in radio should deny ourselves. As a matter of fact, we have some very colorful material to present to you on today's broadcast, which is entitled Folk Remedies. Our synthetic MD for the occasion is naturally our science reporter, Al Zink, who is opening his little black bag to prescribe for our benefit on this latest excursion in science. Thank you, Bob Stone, and how do you do, everyone? I must say I approve of your designation, Colorful, concerning our current program, Bob. I find the facts very enter entertaining, and am much obliged to Dr. Lewis C. Jones of the New York State College for Teachers and editor of the New York Folklore Society's Quarterly, for making me acquainted with them. I suppose by folk remedies you refer to old-fashioned ideas of how to treat various ills, Al? Exactly right, Bob. And there are a good many people who still place trust in these things. Dr. Jones was telling me that he stopped at a little mountain farmhouse in Rensselaer County a few years ago, and entering the kitchen found the whole ceiling covered with strings of herbs hung up to dry. There was pigweed for infections, pine roll to be made into tea to be given for a fever, and sage to be dried and put in a bag to hang around the neck to avoid worms. There were even bunches of blue violets for a nostrum that would take care of sore throats, coughs, and skin diseases. I think I prefer violets to some of the medicines I've had to take, Al. But uh, tell us more about these homemade cures. There are some general cures that are good for man or beast or whatever ails you. For example, if you have almost any kind of a sore, you or your horse or your dog, go at night to some church and take some of the lead from a window frame where it holds the glass in place. After you get home, rub the lead on the sore. It should be gone in the morning. And so might the window pane, I should say, Al. But don't let me interrupt. For any wound, disease, or ailment, if you'll get out before sunup on Easter morning and take water from a stream running east and west, then bathe the afflicted part in that water, your troubles will be over. But if you get sick on the 4th of July, it's kind of hard to wait till Easter. Isn't there some relief that's more immediate? Well, you can rub some garlic on the bottom of your feet every morning before you put your shoes on, Bob. That's guaranteed to keep away disease. Not to mention my few <laughs> friends. There's another belief that when you go past a house where there is a quarantine of some contagious disease, you should expectorate three times, thereby avoiding infection. What quaint customs. I suppose the children of the family receive treats also. Yes, Bob. One of the most interesting remedies concerns a child with asthma. Of course, you can go to a specialist who will find out the child's allergies and give proper inoculations. But this seems so much simpler. You cut off a lock of the child's hair and bore a hole in the wall just above the child's head. Then you stuff in the hair, close up the hole, and just wait. When the child grows above the hole, he will be cured. I don't think my landlady would approve that treatment, of boring holes in the wall. Tell us some more, Al. Well, ever since Job, and probably long before, people have had trouble with boils. Warren Walker, a folklore authority, says that the best way to get rid of them is to soak BB shots in milk for eight days. Then pick the shot out of the sour milk and swallow one a day. Use 12 BB shots to one pint of milk. It's sure to cure. I'll remember that remedy. 
And the next time I get a boil, I'll go to a doctor. Incidentally, Mr. Walker is the author of an article which appeared in a recent issue of the New York Folklore Quarterly about the famous Beckwith murder case near Austerlitz. Beckwith made his reputation as one of New York's most notorious murderers by frying his partner's liver and putting the rest of him down in brine. I imagine that would be a permanent cure for almost anything. Yes. Uh, what remedies are recommended for the common cold, Al? Well, in 1886, Bob, the Albany Times suggested that in the realm of preventive medicine, the best thing to do to ward off a cold was to take a bath in hot whiskey and rock salt twice a year. Well, that might not be too bad if it wasn't for the rock salt, <laughs> but it'd be frightfully expensive. Well, there are less expensive cold remedies I'll be glad to pass on to you. It was discovered down in Calcoon, New York, that if you take the skin of the leaf lard from the left side of a pig, put it on your chest and keep it there, you'll be over your cold in no time. If that by any chance doesn't work, and you're still able to get around despite your hacking cough, you might try crawling through a double-rooted briar moving from west to east. Al, you're killing me. These remedies are becoming positively heartless. They were rugged individuals in the old days, Bob. In the 18th century, it was believed that hot human blood was the best cure for epilepsy. During the French Revolution, epileptics used to crowd under the guillotine so they could literally take a blood bath. But here's a simpler cure for the same disease. First of all, you pull the patient's shirt over his head. Now you go up on the roof, drop a string down the chimney, tie the shirt onto the string, climb back up on the roof, and pull the shirt up through the chimney. Then take the shirt and bury it at a crossroad. It's a mighty tough way to get a shirt out of the house. Now what did our forefathers do in the matter of failing eyesight? Well, there's always the possibility of going to an oculist and being fitted for glasses, Bob. But failing that, there was an interesting belief that if you grew a mustache, it would strengthen your eyes. This was no good for the ladies, but another well-known remedy was to melt the snow which falls in May and keep it in an earthen crock. Then, as occasion arises, apply this to the eyes with a feather. That really tickles my imagination, Al. What else have you got to store for us? And getting back to the younger generation again, Bob, if you have a child in the family who is constantly being frightened, Here's an old remedy for that. You roll dough over the child's body, then remove the dough and burn it. After this has been done, the child won't be afraid of anything. One wonders how some of these old beliefs originated. I suppose you've got something up your sleeve in regard to falling hair, Al. I've been noticing a slight recession around my temples and uh, back a bath of late. Yes, I see what you mean, Bob. There are a number of remedies for this tragedy. I'll give you two of them. Rub onions on the bald spots every morning and rub vigorously. If you think that treatment is too odorous, try washing your head four mornings running before sunrise with snow that has fallen during the night. While we're up around the head, let me tell you how to get rid of a headache. It's an old Italian remedy. You slice a raw tomato and line up the pieces on your forehead. I should have told you that you'd better lie down before you try this one. Then you tie the pieces snugly to your head with a white handkerchief. Wait for a few minutes, and the headache will go away. Well, it seems to be a cure for about everything. I understand there are a lot of measles around this year. Just to be on the safe side, I'd better find out what to do about them. Glad to advise you, Bob. According to Dr. Jones, you may give the children tea made from catnip gathered on the midnight before St. Swithin's Day. Or if that doesn't work, catch two cockroaches, put them in a jar, and as soon as they die, the measles will be over. I'll have you understand there are no cockroaches in my establishment, Al, but I'll keep the cure in mind. Uh, frankly, how much faith are we to put in these remedies? Dr. Jones says there is no question but what even a useless remedy, if you have faith enough in it, may bring about a remarkable cure. Another way of looking at them, of course, is that they are part and parcel of the history of medicine, that part of it which kept alive the people's interest by word of mouth and actual practice. Most of the remedies are harmless enough, though some of them are distinctly unpleasant. I'd say that was a gross understatement, Al, but it certainly has been entertaining to hear about those old remedies. Thank you, and a round of applause to Dr. Jones for his generous contribution to today's program. And ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to have a copy of a paper by Dr. Lewis C. Jones, New York State College for Teachers and editor of the New York Folklore Society's Quarterly, 
a paper which recounts the story you have just heard together with other interesting information, all you have to do is address a penny postcard to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are now listening, asking for scientific paper number 246, entitled Folk Remedies. That's scientific paper number 246, Folk Remedies. Your copy will be put in the mail free of charge. And now on to that department of our program, which our regular listeners like to call question and answer time. Herein, we answer scientific questions which have been sent in to us by you listeners. The answers reflect the most up-to-date and accurate information available, since they are based on facts provided by staff members of the General Electric Research Laboratory or other equally trustworthy institutions. I hope, Al, you'll find a remedy for every problem submitted to our question box. From Canajo Harry, New York, comes this inquiry regarding light from the stars. It reads, How are the distances of the sun and stars estimated? The distance is measured in light years to the stars, I know, but stars have shown continuously, and how would astronomers know when the light started and when it reached the Earth? The distance of the stars is determined by their parallax, Bob. If you hold your finger about a foot in front of your eyes, then close first one eye and then the other, you will see the finger seem to shift back and forth against the background. Then if you hold it at arm's length and repeat the experiment, you will find it shifting, but not so much. The amount of shift is the parallax of your finger, and it is greater the nearer it is. And the same principle is applied to star measurement? Yes, Bob. Astronomers take photographs of the sky at different times of the year, six months apart, when the Earth is in opposite ends of its orbit, and separated by a distance of 186 million miles, or twice the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Comparing such photographs, the near stars seem to shift against the background of the very distant ones, and by measuring them very accurately, the distance of several thousand stars has been determined. There are other means of extending this and measuring the distance of stars so far away that they do not show any parallax, but you will find these discussed in any modern textbook on astronomy. One more question about the skies before we come down to Earth, Al. Our listener wants to know how long it would be before everything would be frozen solid if our sun were suddenly obliterated. If the sun suddenly ceased to exist, something would have to be done with the material of which it consists, and thus there would be a tremendous outburst of atomic energy which would probably be enough to make the Earth incandescent and even to melt it. Then it would cool off, and after all the heat had been radiated out, it would reach the temperature of interstellar space close to absolute zero. This would take a very long time, and it would be hard to estimate how long it would be. From the way our listener's question is phrased, Al, I imagine he postulates some process in which the sun would suddenly be annihilated without any great outburst of energy as a result. In that case, since radiation of the sun takes about eight minutes to reach us, light and heat would last about eight minutes. Then everything would be dark, and it would be a rapid cooling. Within a matter of hours, there would be a cooling of all parts of the Earth, though it might be many days, even weeks, before the whole Earth would be frozen. Even then, some volcanic regions might continue to remain warm for a much longer time. A young man in Mount Upton sends us this problem. If Mr. A travels five degrees eastward near the equator, while Mr. B travels five degrees westward from Washington, D.C., which will go the greater number of miles? Since our listener refers to travel east and west, I presume that when he speaks about going five degrees, he refers to five degrees of longitude. In that case, the man traveling along the equator would go the greater number of miles. The meridians of longitude all converge at the poles so that they are farthest apart at the equator. Therefore, close to the North Pole, one could travel 360 degrees of longitude or all the way around in a fraction of a mile, whereas at the equator, he would have to go for about 25,000 miles to go through 360 degrees. Well, here's a short one from young lady, Al. She asks, will it ever be possible for man actually to see an electron? It is impossible for man to see an electron itself. Electron tracks are seen in a cloud chamber, a glass chamber containing damp air. The track resembles a fine thread. And now here's an interesting question, a to be or not to be sort of thing. Is there a sound produced when a tree crashes to the ground and no human being is near to hear it? That would depend, Bob, on the definition of sound. The dictionary gives two definitions. The first one defines sound as the sensation produced by vibration.
According to this, there would be no sound if there were nobody within range because there would be no brain to receive the sensation. The second definition has to do with the vibrational energy which is caused by, say, a tree falling. Under this concept, the vibration of the atmosphere would be there whether anybody was there or not. Perhaps you'll favor us with one more answer, Al. The lady inquires, would a bungalow made out of field stones be damper than one made from wood siding? Under the same external conditions, there would be little difference. If there is any difference, it would be that the wood siding is damper because wood has a very high affinity for dampness. Well, unless we want a damper put on us, Al, we'd better yield to the gentleman in the control room and leave the air. So I'll hurriedly say thank you, Al Zink, and goodbye, everyone, until our next excursion in science.